Welcome everyone. I'm Melanie roth Gorelick, the Senior Vice President of the Jewish Council for Public Affairs. We are very excited about JCPA's upcoming civil rights mission and thrilled to have you all joining us both today and for the trip. We have 54 people signed up for the mission and currently have a waiting list and we are really, really glad that there is such strong level of interest in our network about this uh, mission. As many of you know, for the past few years, JCPA has made criminal justice a key issue. When we started our initiative in 2016, only one JCRC reported working on any type of criminal justice reform. Today, after many webinars, conference panels, visits, and advocacy days, dozens of JCRCs are now involved in criminal justice efforts around the country. The mission came about as part of our effort to re-engage the Jews, Jewish community in today's civil rights movement. To begin this mission, our aim is to provide the participants with foundational knowledge on the role of the Jewish community in the civil rights during the 50s and 60s, and then thinking about our relationships today. We will do this by providing an opportunity to explore our past traditional narratives of black Jewish relations, as well as look at the relationship between the black Jewish community today in modern times. Ultimately, our aim is for you to be inspired and to get involved in social activism when we return home from our mission and be equipped with the knowledge to engage authentically in those spaces. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Rabbi Shai Held and Bruce Turnbull. We will hear from both of them and then open the webinar for Q&A. Rabbi Shai Held is the President, Dean, and Chair in Jewish Thought at Hadar, where he also directs the Center for Jewish Leadership and Ideas. Previously, he served for six years as scholar in residence at Kehilat Hadar in New York City and taught both theology and halacha at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He also served as Director of Education at Harvard Hillel. A 2011 recipient of the prestigious Covenant Award for Excellence in Jewish Education, Rabbi Held has been named multiple times, very impressive, to Newsweek's list of the 50 most influential rabbis in America. He holds a doctorate in religion from Harvard and has published several books, including Abraham Joshua Heschel, The Call for Transcendence and the Heart of Torah. We're so glad to bring you into the JCPA fold and that you're willing to make the time for our call today. Bruce Turnbull is co-chair of the Criminal Justice Reform Initiative for the Jewish Council for Public Affairs and is a member of the JCPA Policy Advisory Committee. For the past decade, Bruce has his own law practice and he is co-founder of and pro bono counsel to the Bolicho Jewish Heritage Society a charitable organization founded by Jewish descendants of a town in what is now Ukraine. He also serves on the Lawyers Committee of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and on the board of the Jews United for Justice Campaign Fund. Bruce holds a law degree from GW University of School of Law and is an expert on the Jewish community in civil rights in the 50s and 60s, and we're so glad Bruce, to have you chairing and leading this civil rights mission with us. And um, I turn over the webinar to you. Okay, great. Thanks, Melanie. What I'd like to do is to, okay, I'm seeing Rabbi Held. Um, <laughs> to, there we are. Uh, what, I, what I'd like to do today is to run through in very summary fashion um, some major points about Jews and the civil rights movement mostly historically, mostly leading up to 1968. I've got a slide or two at the end about sort of what happened post-68. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the point here is to give you an overview. There are whole books that have been written on this subject. And so a few slides in 15 or 20 minutes isn't gonna give you a, an in-depth uh, knowledge, but it should give you some, some sense of, of where, where Jews were in the civil rights movement and what changed after 1968. So let's let's get started. Um, Haya, go to the next slide. Okay, Jew Jews and Jewish organizations um, sort of followed two themes in their reaction and, and participation in the civil rights movement. 
Um, many of the active supporters were, were there um, based on self-interest and tikkun alone. Um, but there were also Jews and Jewish institutions that did not participate, were not, uh, they withheld their support based on self-interest, fear, and caution. Vast majority of Jews and Jewish organizations have supported the civil rights movement. Uh, individuals and Jewish organizations provided the most steadfast support of any ethnic or religious group outside of the African American community. And Jews were over overwhelmingly supported uh, politicians who supported civil rights uh, policies. Next. Um, to give you very quick background on this, on the earliest days, in the 17th to the 19th centuries, the first American Jews were Sephardic, mostly fleeing Portuguese persecution in Brazil. Uh, and then after, thereafter, uh, most Jews until the late 19th century were Germanic origin, uh, generally well-educated. They reflected uh, the region that they lived in. In the South, there were many who owned slaves and some were slave traders in the North. Uh, some joined anti-slavery efforts. Um, but beginning in, in about eight, 1880, um, when there were 250,000 Jews in America, um, the Jewish migration began. And so um, the, uh, by 1924, the, when the immigration laws changed to cut off most East, Eastern European immigration, there were over 2 million Jews had arrived, mostly settling in Northern cities and anti-Semitism and economic hardships were a significant problem. So next. Um, okay, in, in this period as well, did we skip a slide? Yes. Okay, wait, sorry. <laughs> Um, when the Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe uh, saw parallels from their, their experience in Europe, um, the lynching and race riots, um, including white um, initiated race riots, were compared to pogroms. And the Yiddish press covered these stories and promoted the, the pogrom comparison. As, as we indicated, the migration patterns um, converged in northern cities. Um, as the Jewish uh, immigration came from Eastern Europe, um, many blacks also migrated from the South and settled in the Northeastern and Midwestern cities. And both anti-Semitism and racism were common throughout. Next. Um, during this period, um, there was a lot of Jewish, again, I think we skipped a couple. Hi, can we go back? No? Okay, sorry. Um, the, the, the Jewish philanthropy, uh, Julius Rosenwald is a good example of this. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, the Rosenwald um, by Aviva Kempner, uh, you should really try, try and see it. It's not available streaming, uh, but, but it is being shown in a variety of places and you can get a DVD. Um, he was a tremendous philanthropist. Uh, he was the chairman of Sears Roebuck and was a major funder for the NAACP, the Urban League, and Black YMCAs. And he funded many schools throughout the South um, and, and was on the board of trustees of Tuskegee. So next. Um, the big three civil rights organizations sort of leading up to the 60s were the NAACP, which was founded in 1910 with a number of Jews as part of its organizing group and major funding from Jews and Jewish organizations. Uh, its board was chaired by Joel Spingarn, who's a Jew, um, 1914 to 39, and his brother headed the legal committee for many years. The Urban League was created, again, with a sizable number of Jews supporting the organization, and Julius Rosenwald was its second largest donor. The Leadership Conference on Civil Rights was founded in 1950 um, with Arnold Aronson uh, of what was then NACRAC, but, but isn't, we now know, of course, and love as JCPA. Um, was one of the three founders, and it was a, an umbrella organization sort of based on the JCPA model. It was and still is the civil rights umbrella organizations, and many Jewish groups uh, and, or, and individual Jews are, are participants in it. Uh, JCPA uh, housed the leadership conference for many years, um, and um, uh, it's Arnie Aronson served as its secretary for many years, 
uh, and later uh, founded um, an education uh, foundation um, before his uh, before his death. So next. Um, Jewish organizations from the period that are important. Obviously, JCPA, uh, then known as NACRAC, was formed in 1944. Um, and in 1950, as I just mentioned, co-founded the Leadership Conference and, and uh, was the uh, host for the Leadership Conference's offices. In the 50s and 60s, JCPA worked extensively on school and housing desegregation, affirmative action, and employment discrimination. Uh, Arnie Aronson was one of the 10 organizers of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Um, there was, however, some internal dissension from Southern Community Relations Councils, uh, but, but NACRAC did studies showing that Jewish mer merchants did not lose business under desegregation, and that combated uh, some of the uh, opposition. Um, a, um, ADL uh, was also very active, and they joined in uh, amicus briefs uh, throughout the period. Next, uh, AJC, the American, Jew the American Jewish Committee, and the American Jewish Congress were both very active, and the National Council of Jewish Women was was maybe not as prominent in some of the public uh, uh, views of of the civil rights movement, but it it contributed significantly to uh, various. Um, uh, activities uh, throughout the period. So next, I, I'll mention, I just went through that very quickly. Um, we will provide a copy of these slides to everybody. I'm going to go through fairly quickly in order to cover uh, cover quite a lot of territory here. Um, at the March on Washington, uh, Rabbi uh, Joachim Prince, who was the head of the American Jewish Congress, spoke immediately before Martin Luther King. I think it's important to to focus on what he said. When I was a rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, I learned many things. The most important thing I learned in my life was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem. The most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic is silence. So the, the Jews who participated in the civil rights movement and the Jewish organizations were coming from a place where being silent was part was the major problem, um, and, and the, the the experience uh, with the rise of of Hitler and and Nazis in Germany and many many people remaining silent was critical to their understanding of the need to engage in the civil rights movement. Okay, next. Um, these are a number of other participants from the period. Um, you all can take a look at, at the quoted language. I want to focus briefly on Heather Booth, um, who, who many of you may know is still very active as an activist. She, she's been a feminist, she's been a Democratic Party leader. Um, but in, in the 60s, she participated in Freedom Summer. And she also was a folk singer. And the songs of the civil rights movement, this quote uh, indicates how important they were to keep spirits together and to keep people um, uh, feeling good about what they were doing. I'm sort of hopeful that we'll find somebody who, who can lead some of these songs as we go on our mission uh, uh, later in the month. So next. 1960s. Black civil rights leadership was significantly from the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Uh, many of you may recall that was where Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, was, that was his organization and it, it has continued, uh, continued for a number of years after his death. The NAACP, the Leadership Conference and the Urban League were very important. Uh, the Leadership Conference focused on legislation, the Urban League on, on coordination with other groups. And the NAACP was sort of the more traditional civil rights base. There were two other organizations that captured the young and the student action uh, in, during the period. Congress on Racial Equality, or CORE, although founded in 1942, it, it really came into its own in the 1960s. Uh, it was prominent in the Freedom Rider movement um, and, and was a, a critical organization in the period. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, um, was very action oriented. It was the organizer for Freedom Summer, for many of the sit-ins, for the voter registration dot drives. It also was the place where the militants um, sort of turned the movement, and we'll look at this briefly uh, in a few minutes, 
but in the later 60s, it, it, SNCC really left the mainstream. Throughout the 60s, all of these organizations got large portions of their funding, maybe a majority, from Jews and Jewish organizations. Um, this is just a few slides now to, to show some of the Jewish activists who participated. Uh, this young woman uh, was a recent graduate of Smith College, and she joined the Freedom, uh, Freedom Riders uh, uh, organized by CORE. Next. The, the March on Washington, we already mentioned briefly. Um, there were these slides, these pictures show, um, you know, the Central Conference of American Rabbis as participants. The slide on the right, uh, JCPA's Arnie Aronson. Uh, there are other uh, prominent Jews who are pictured there. Joe Rao, uh, who was one of the leading lawyers, is in the center of that picture. Next. Um, this is a picture of, uh, and, and the, the identifications on the right indicate that there are a number of prominent Jewish leaders who were, you know, at the forefront of the actual march part of, of the March on Washington. Next. There were also Jews who, who went at some risk to themselves. Um, I mean, I think it's probably well known that two of the three uh, uh, people who were murdered in, in summer of 1964 were Jews, uh, Andrew Gord Goldman and um, Mark um, And then uh, the, in, during the same summer, there's a picture of Heather Booth uh, Frieden, s singing with Fran Fannie Lou Hamer, who was a very famous uh, leader of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. Next. In the Freedom Summer, um, it, was, it was a project that was, was organized primarily by SNCC, but, but in coordination with a number of organizations. It was aimed heavily at uh, voter registration. It set up the case for the 1965 Voter Voting Rights Act. Um, there were roughly a thousand student volunteers who came, and, and estimates are that as many as half of those may have been Jewish. Um, there was also quite a lot of violence. Um, you know, 80 Freedom Summer workers were beaten. There were 37 churches bombed or burned. There were black homes or businesses that bombed and burned. And the civil rights leaders, uh, as I indicated, three of them were killed uh, uh, and then in, in the one incident, and then one was killed in a car collision. Um, so next. March on, on Selma, which was uh, obviously a, a sort of seminal uh, part of the uh, civil rights movement. Um, there were actually two marches. One was the one which was known as Bloody Sunday when, when the uh, student marchers um, were, were beaten uh, badly. After that, there came a call for people to come. And this is the one where, where Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel is famously said to have said, uh, I felt my legs were praying. And the picture on the left is sort of an iconic uh, picture. Of, of him next to Martin Luther King. Um, on the right, there were there were a number of the JCPA participants who were there. Um, the executive uh, Isaiah Minkoff and Arnie Aronson uh, were part of that march as well. So next. Um, however, there were Jewish supporters of segregation. Uh, many Southern Jews uh, went along or even actively supported the efforts to combat uh, desegre desegregation. Um, this was community pressure, fear of loss of business, fear of rising anti-Semitism, and in a few cases, uh, sort of genuine support. Uh, there were Jews who signed, joined the White Citizens Council. Um, even as early as 1960, JCPA uh, identified that, um, you know, Jews in many instances had been the targets of, of both Negroes and segregationists. Um, and there was, to a degree, Jews were seen as part of the hostile white community. Um, and that was a significant uh, factor uh, during the period as well. Next. Um, 
here are a number of Jews who were vocally and visibly involved in the resistance to civil rights, uh, one who was a prominent prosecutor uh, of freedom riders, uh, another who, who led uh, opposition to compulsory school attendance. And uh, that, was a, that was, with desegregation, many, municipal, many areas in the South simply closed their public schools. And, and so legislation to require school attendance um, was something to, to combat that. And this fellow, uh, Solomon Blatt, uh, was, was against that, that movement. Um, there's a guy named Saul Tepper, who was uh, one of the, part of the Selma uh, opposition, um, included, he included support for Sheriff Jim Clark and the violent opposition to the Selma marches. Um, there was another, uh, Charles Block from uh, Georgia, who was vice chair of the Georgia delegation to the 1948 Democratic Convention and a leading opponent of the civil rights plan. So there were Jews who were, who were prominent on the other side of civil rights uh, as well. Next. So um, getting back to, to the, a lot of the effort um, of the civil rights movement was aimed at getting core legislation passed. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 was obviously the leading um, piece of legislation. It was something that uh, President Kennedy came to support for his death and that uh, President Johnson then picked up um, and quite dramatically as a, as a Southerner himself. Uh, the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights was, was basically the leader over the negotiation of the legislation. Um, and uh, leading the, uh, the the lawyers the, the leadership conference team was Joe Rao and Arnold Aronson and Marvin Kaplan, along with Clarence Mitchell. Uh, Rao and Mitchell were the sort of leaders of negotiating legislative language and strategizing. Uh, Aronson and Kaplan coordinated grassroots uh, lobbying by by civil rights, Jewish, and interfaith groups. Um, and this was aimed particularly at persuading Republicans in the Midwest. Um, to based on their own constituent contacts. Um, many groups came to Washington. There were hundreds of rabbis and synagogue congregants who came in early 1964 uh, to lobby for the Civil Rights Act. Um, in January, there was a bus chartered by the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, brought dozens of rabbis and congregants to lobby against weakening amendment. So next. Um, the, the Civil Rights Act was passed in 1964. The two follow-on um, civil core civil rights uh, legislation were the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. Uh, the Voting Rights Act was actually drafted in the Reform Movement's conference room and um, was a, a major uh, uh, triumph uh, from the civil rights movement. Fair Housing Act actually, well, it was supported uh, by Jewish Jews and Jewish organizations. It began the question of, you know, how does this affect us uh, personally? And so it, there were some issues uh, within the organizations on the Fair Housing Act. Next. Um, the passage of the major civil rights, so, so, so what happened? We got to 1968. Um, I think it's well known that the Jewish community and the black community separated, sometimes amicably, sometimes maybe not so much. So what happened in 1968 that, that, that caused that or, or that, that demonstrated that? First of all, the three laws were passed, so we won. Everybody celebrated, it was a great victory, and, and so moving on to the next thing. Uh, but there were tensions that had already been brewing. Um, First of all, uh, black nationalist movements formed in the early 60s uh, and began gaining more traction. I talked about SNCC's role in that. Um, Jewish involvement was sometimes seen as part of white paternalism. Uh, this, even in 1960, JCPA had identified that white cooperation or help is a poor read on which to lead uh, or even a fraudulent and deliberately deceitful mask of white domination and exploitation. That was a perception that, that existed. And in the North, um, as the majority of white businesses in black neighborhoods, Jews often became targets of riots and boycotts. Ironically, the very fact that Jews were willing to have, have businesses in, in black neighborhoods caused them to be the target uh, when the riots happened. Next. 
Um, just to sum up, um, sort of what happened um, in, in the black community uh, with the advancement on, um, on self-reliance and black power, um, there was less room for anyone who was not black. Uh, the new housing laws put the black and Jewish communities into greater competition and the civil rights organizations wanted to be governed by those who were most impacted. In the Jewish community, other issues rose to prominence. Student activism and protests moved to the Vietnam War. Israel became a predominant issue for the organized Jewish community. Jews themselves moved to the suburbs uh, and discrimination receded. Um, Jews were viewed as becoming white. Uh, obviously, anti-Semitism has recurred, but, but, but the, the Jewish community was viewed as, as, as having melded into the white community. Um, and as civil rights movement moved north, there was more, it was more personal to many Jews. Uh, there were riots that, as we talked about, destroyed bu Jewish businesses. Uh, busing uh, promoted school integration was a very uh, controversial matter. And the New York teacher strike was, was itself a confrontation between the Jewish labor organizers and the black residents who wanted local control of their schools. And that was a major schism uh, in the New York community. And since New York is so large and, and so concentrated for both black and Jewish populations, it was, it was a critical factor. And I think that's it. So we'll move on and, and go to uh, uh, Rabbi Shai. Great. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Thank you for that, Bruce. Um, in the few minutes that I have, I really just want to share um, a few thoughts about what we hear and read from African-American intellectuals about their perception of sort of how the relationship has become more tenuous and problematic over the years, um, and maybe to share a few thoughts about that as well. The first piece, which I think dovetails perfectly with what Bruce was just talking about, is that we sometimes hear um, African-American leaders say that Jews overplay the 1960s, by which they mean it was a long time ago. And there are many active and urgent struggles going on right now. And the temptation to believe that participation in the past somehow exempts people from engaging in ongoing struggles in the present is, in their mind, um, an ongoing perception. Um, Bruce showed before the iconic photograph of Rabbi Heschel and Dr. King on the bridge in Selma. And of course, it is much easier to valorize civil rights activism of the past than it is to embrace and support civil rights struggles um, in the present. Um, so that's one piece that I think is actually very important. Um, another that I think you already began to hear from black intellectuals in the 60s and then certainly in the 70s and the 80s to the present is the sense that Jews have been prone to false or overly simplistic comparisons or equivalences, right? Jews are, or perhaps were, far more convinced than African Americans were that the two groups have and had so much in common. What you would sometimes read black intellectuals saying, I, I, I've seen this as far back as the 80s, but I imagine it's true earlier too, um, is that Jews don't realize the ways that what they are comparing is the Jewish past and the black present. Um, or as Julius Lester, an African-American convert to Judaism and a controversial figure in his own right, put it, when African Americans feel an affinity for Jews, it is for the Jews of Europe less than for the Jews of America, with whom they feel they have in many ways um, less in common. Um, I will say personally in my own voice that one of the comments that I have heard not infrequently that I think is most problematic and frankly kind of offensive is the rhetoric of why can't they be more like us um, on the part of, of some people in the Jewish community. Um, because what's offensive about it, among other things, I think, is it's really kind of willful ignorance of contemporary reality. There is an ocean of social scientific research that documents the ways in which racial discrimination still remains an enormous obstacle um, to black achievement and economic progress. Um, you know, one of the most, I think, alarming in its simplicity, alarming um, studies the one that 
um, sociologists from Harvard send out resumes, um, exact same resumes. On one resume, you have a kind of generic you know, name associated with whiteness. And on the other resume, again, same exact resume, you have the name Tyrone Jones. And they concluded that simply a white name is equivalent to five years of work experience when it comes to getting hired. Um, so uh, there is a, a sense often that Jews believe more progress has taken place than in fact um, it has. I, I will say I stumble upon this day after day after day. Um, white people, including white Jews, um, even many otherwise well-intentioned people, simply do not want to know about the depth and extent of contemporary black suffering. Um, or when they do know about it, are sometimes tempted to insist that it's black people's own fault, that it's a black cultural problem, et cetera. Um, there's a, a very powerful line that James Baldwin writes in his famous New York Times um, op-ed called um, the black, I think it's called the black man is anti-Semitic because he's anti-white. This is, I'm gonna read you this quote for a second. Very few Americans, and this includes very few Jews, have the courage to recognize that the America of which they dream and boast is not the America in which the Negro lives. It is the country which the Negro has never seen. That is, I think, an amazing encapsulation, a powerful encapsulation of what many African Americans and especially African American intellectuals um, believe about the gap and the tension between the black and the Jewish communities and between blacks and whites more general. Now, here, I think it gets more messy, and I would try to couch this, if I could, in a psychological way, which is that there is a very frequent black failure to understand how vulnerable Jews still feel, and a very frequent Jewish failure to understand how much more extreme black vulnerability in America, in fact, is. Right? I think in general on the left in America, the farther left you go, there is an increasing insensitivity to the ways that Jews feel vulnerable um, in all kinds of ways. Um, and again, conversely, a playing down of just how vulnerable many African Americans in fact are. Um, I think part one way to imagine the the breakdown in the relationship, to the extent that that's really the right term, which I'm not sure it is, but one way to imagine that is to talk about feelings of betrayal on both sides. African Americans have felt betrayed by mainstream Jewish leadership um, and have felt, and I think also psychologically, the sense that here is another underdog group that made it, why have we been left out? Um, and in a very particular moment, when some prominent Jewish voices opposed affirmative action publicly for the first time, that was a real kind of breaking point where the, the rhetoric of betrayal, um, rightly or wrongly, emerges. And Jews, of course, um, have often felt um, betrayed, betrayed by African-American leaders and intellectuals, two obvious ways. One is, of course, what seems to many of us like half-hearted opposition and resistance to black anti-Semitism. And of course, more recently, widespread hostility to Zionism and Israel, about which maybe we can say more um, during the Q and A. Um, I, I did want to say one thing that I think is important, especially you know for a group that is engaging with these issues. It is still very common. I think it is almost always the case, in fact, that the question of Black Jewish relations is couched as a discussion about two different groups of people, and what Jews of color have been loudly insisting for a long time, and I think we ought to start hearing them, is that there are many people for whom black Jewish relations um, actually is what they embody. They are in fact Jews of color and perhaps ought to be playing a larger role in conversations between those um, two communities. Uh, there's a lot more to say, obviously. Maybe I'll stop here because I think my time is more or less up and then we can go back and forth in the Q&A. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're now going to move into the Q&A part of the program. Um, but the way that you need to ask your question is through the chat box. So I hope that you can all see it on your screen. If you can, if anyone has any questions, we, it's not a Zoom call, so we can't see you. But 
if you type your question in, we'll read it out, um, and we're monitoring the question. So let's take a few minutes, um, or a minute, for you to type your questions, and then we'll take it from there. Melanie, maybe maybe while we're waiting for a question or two, I, I just want to emphasize that we we you sent out or the JCPA staff sent out um, a, a a reading list or a, a recommended list for people to take a look at, and um, in particular with regard to this call, we we sent out a link to the James Baldwin article that uh, was just quoted. Uh, those are things, and not some of them are are long book length and that sort of thing. But there are some that are very accessible, um, and you can read in five or ten minutes. And I, I would really recommend uh, people taking a look at those and and giving some thought, so that while we're on the trip, uh, we can have some good conversation. Great. Um, thank you, Bruce. Um, right. One of the questions is, how does the anti-Semitism of the Women's March leadership in the Black Lives Matter charters, right, something that we can combat. something we can combat yet support the overall goal? So, Bruce, do you want to go first? Yes, yeah. or now go ahead. Go ahead. Well. Okay. Well, so we, my own perspective on this is that first we should not ever be embarrassed to call out anti-Semitism when we see it. I, I, I really want to be unequivocal about that, and I think equivocation on that point is really unhelpful. Um, that said, I think we have to avoid the temptation to believe, which we sometimes do, that some black voices speak for all black voices. Um, you know, there are many people involved, um, including in the leadership of the Black Lives Matter movement, who do not particularly harbor biases towards Jews, who are not particularly obsessed with the parallels between Ferguson and Gaza. You know, it's, I think that in many ways, the work that will matter most in the long run um, is the work of identifying African-American leaders with whom real conversations can be had and who in fact are eager to have those conversations. Meaning, I don't think that we should allow black Jewish cooperation and black Jewish relations to be hijacked effectively by um, extremist voices. I, again, and I don't mean that in order, I'm not attempting in any way to play down the reality of what goes on there. I think also it's worth saying, and I, I'm not sure what the implications of this are exactly, but it's worth saying that one of the things that Palestinian leaders did very well is the moment Ferguson happened, their expressions of solidarity were forceful, clear, unequivocal, and they captured the hearts of the young African-American leadership in Ferguson. That was a very smart, um, effective move on their part. It worked. Um, and I, again, I'm not really sure what the implications of that are. I'd be happy to have that conversation with anyone who wants to try to think it through with me, because I don't have a clear, you know, a, what the, I'm not clear what the implications are, but that was actually a strategic move on the part of Palestinian leaders and a very, very shrewd one. They are quicker on Twitter than we are. I think one of the things that's actually worth noticing is the Jewish community and its mainstream organizations, because we are organizations with legacies and processes, we are slower. Twitter happens very fast. That's where that bond was formed. It was formed in tweets within an hour. You know, and we are not quick on our feet in that way. I don't know that it can be otherwise. Individual Jews, individual, individual Jewish voices can be um, quick, but the sort of slow, deliberative structure of the Jewish organizations, for good and for bad, is what it is. Yeah, I, I would just add that I think that, and, and underscore a point you just made, that, that working together with um, black organizations on, um, the civil rights issues of today, most particularly as we have with JCPA in the criminal justice reform, can be done without um, agreeing on, with with whoever you're working with on other things. And and I, I mean, I'm JCPA's representative in the Interfaith Criminal Justice Coalition in wa lobbying in Washington on criminal justice, and there are organizations there that support BDS that have that we have other. Uh, issues we have issues with on on uh, in other areas, 
but where we have been willing to come together and work on criminal justice reform. And I think that that builds the, the relationships. I mean, it's, it's doing the right thing on criminal justice, but it also builds relationships that hopefully over time will allow the gaps to be narrowed on these other issues. Um, Rabbi, you had spoken about um, uh, the role of Jews of color, and JCPA passed a resolution um, calling for more inclusion and diversity um, in the in the Jewish community. And I was wondering if you could talk a little, if you could say a little bit more about how we can better engage uh, Jews of color in our criminal justice work and in our JCRCs. Um, and local work, period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not to pass the buck, but I imagine you have more insight into that than I do. But I, but since you ask, I'll share a couple of thoughts about this. You know, one is that I think the issue of Jews of color not being not being included or not being sufficiently included in our work on civil rights and criminal justice reform is really just derivative of a larger issue of Jews of color not feeling included in the Jewish community writ large. Meaning I don't think that the problem is specifically there. The problem is that Jews of color often use the language of invisibility. And it's actually striking to me in my own work, in my the pastoral side of my work, I'm often struck by how Jews of color use the same image for themselves as disabled Jews use for themselves. Talking about not being seen, being rendered invisible, being, you know, hearing people talk about blacks and Jews and thinking, wait, which one am I? Why are you not acknowledging the complexity and the sort of overlapping in that Venn diagram? So I, I think actually that at the deepest level, um, it's about the Jewish community as a whole, um, acknowledging, welcoming, being inviting towards um, black Jews um, in general, Jews of color in general. And I think really also in opening up spaces and inviting Jews of color to share their own first person accounts of their experience. Um, people feel like they have an awful lot to say. In other words, there are people in the Jewish community who have had what African-Americans call the conversation with their parents. The conversation, as many of you know, refers to when African-Americans, especially young African-American boys, um, sit down with their parents and are told what to do if they are pulled over by a police officer and warned about, you know, how being pulled over when you're black is a totally different experience very often than being pulled over when you're white. And there are Jews who I have heard say, you know, I want to be invited to tell the story of those conversations because there are Jews like me who have that. Um, so I think it's really just as simple as creating platforms and inviting those voices in. And crucially, convincing young African-American Jews that they are not being invited in as mere tokens, but are invited in to really have a voice and help shape policy. Thank you. I'll only, I'll, I'll only chime in to say that as, as the grandfather of two young grandsons who are, who are being raised as Jews of color, um, I look forward to uh, uh, participating in their lives and 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 engage and hoping that they get engaged uh, as well. So we are embarking on this mission, and when we are there, we are uh, we're I believe we're going to learn history, and we'll be moved, and we hope to have conversations about um, further conversations about how we can move even more in a stronger way to engaging with the African-American community locally and nationally, um, and working on not only criminal justice reform, but voting rights and other major civil rights issues of the day. One of the, one of the issues that come up for people who are starting to engage in this space or are some of the more um, active, not African-American, but criminal justice organizations bring up is positioning of the mainstream Jewish community on Israel and our support for BDS and even for um, anti-BDS legislation. What, how should we grapple with this? What are some of thoughts um, or a paradigm for us to grapple with this as how do we hold both? 
um, and work in this space? How can we still be effective? Um, it, it's becoming, you know, we just had the Israeli elections um, and it's becoming more difficult uh, to, you know, to not play, to not be almost affected by the current polarization that not only exists in the Jewish community, but in the non-Jewish communities and those working on progressive causes. Bruce, I'm very happy to defer to you here. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say, I, I, I said this earlier, but I, but I think it's a direct response, which is that at least in some contexts, it is, I think, possible to and constructive to have an agreement within the work that you're doing on, say, criminal justice reform, be, you know, focused on that and set aside um, differences that may exist on some of these other issues. The Interfaith Criminal Justice Coalition has an agreement that they simply do not discuss Israel or BDS uh, within within our work, and we work together on criminal justice reform. Um, and 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 so I think that to to a degree, there's there's that um, possibility. Um, I think the other is that it it's going to well, it's going to be increasingly hard. Quite honestly, I think the 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 you know the even the early stories about the re outcome of the the Israel election um, suggest that this is this is going to be a an increasing problem, not a decreasing problem, uh, unless there's some you know huge uh, event that that's not predicted at this point. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would add as a footnote um, here that I actually think, for whatever it's worth, that. The most effective way in the long term um, to combat BDS becoming a litmus test is to make sure that voices in the Jewish community that are um, against, that are in favor of ending the occupation, but are not supportive of BDS, be amplified and not be silenced. In other words, I mean, I have said very often, and I'm not a member of any of these organizations, but I have said very often to students of mine who are on the board of APAC, you know, the biggest mistake you make is running. J Street young kids out of the community. They are the kids who can fight BDS effectively, right? I mean, that's a much different conversation, but there's actually a lot to say there. Um, and again, I would reiterate what I said. I don't think anyone should be embarrassed to call out um, anti-Semitism when that's what it is. I mean, I, I took a lot of flack personally for what I wrote and said about the movement for Black Lives, you know, use of the term genocide to apply to Israel, which in my view is nothing short of a blood libel. Um, that said, you know, it as Bruce was saying, not re relationships with other groups are not all or nothing. We do not have to sign each other's entire list of commitments in the world, and it's possible to do important work together. And it remains possible, I think. Uh, Rabbi, you, you pointed out uh, some of the areas where the Jewish community and the African American community kind of parted ways. But as we um, uh, are thinking about our work moving forward, what are some suggestions you have, if you haven't shared them already, on what we can do to repair the relationships? Well, I, so I would say a couple things. One is, you know, I've talked about things that divide us. I think the growth in recent years of white nationalism and white supremacy in this country actually create some possibility of new conversation and new alliances because to put it crudely those who most hate them hate us too and vice versa it is as simple as that right you know david duke likes neither of us let's put it that way um so that's one piece i think in other words what's interesting is that the moment has changed um a little bit or at least the potential for the moment to change is there. And then, I, look, I, I think Jews being outspoken and committed on issues of civil rights to which they feel committed, um, two of the ones that you've talked about are two of the ones that are most important to me, um, um, criminal justice reform, voting rights, um, are, are obviously really crucial ones. and. I think what you hear from African American leaders often, I mean, this goes to something Bruce was describing earlier about the accusation of Jewish quote unquote paternalism, um, is really to embrace the self-consciousness of being an ally rather than a leader on these causes. 
Um, Jews do not need to be, you know, at the front of the march in order to be active participants of the march. Um, I think that that's, you know, uh, something that's that, that that some of us ought to be willing um, unequivocally to do. Um, and I think we can also acknowledge the complexity that the the entirety of the Jewish community will not agree on many of these issues. But I don't think we can allow ourselves, those of us who are passionate about these issues and who believe that these issues are really what's necessary for America to be a more just society, for America to be what America we believe is intended to be, we can't allow ourselves to be silenced waiting for unanimity. That is just a pipe dream and a prescription for silence, which is not an acceptable posture. I wanted to underscore a point that, that, that Rabbi Shai just made, that, that we don't have to be the leader, we don't have to be the organizer of the act, activity in order to be very effective and to be a very important part of the activity. And this is something that we in JCPA have underscored in our work on criminal justice reform where we've said to the local JCRCs, find what people are already doing and join. You don't have to either invent the wheel or reinvent the wheel, and you don't have to be the leader, but you can be an active and, and helpful participant. I mean, an example of, at the recent JCPA conference, the, the somebody from Cleveland was talking about, they, they were in, a, in alliance on some bail reform legislation, and so in, it, it turned out that the that they in order to lobby the Ohio legislature, you needed to go during on a day during the week. Many of the African American participants in the coalition in Cleveland could not take the day off. They could, simply didn't have the ability to do that. So many of the Jews who were involved were able to go represent the coalition there, even though that it was they weren't leading the coalition. But that was a that was a a a. a part that they could play effectively and usefully and 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 be there. And so so find the, the role that is helpful, not necessarily the role that is is sort of dictating to everybody and 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 being the leader. Thank you both so much. Do you have any final um, anything that you want to leave us with? Any final words as we conclude the webinar today? I guess I would say from from my sorry from my 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 part of this is, is that I think that I, I I was a history major in college I I've done a great deal of work uh, Susie and I've done a great deal of work on our our own genealogies I think history is important I think where we come from is important I think what our you know forefathers and ancestors have done is important and so I think the history of civil rights is is important for Jews to know but it's also not enough. Um, you, you, we can't say, um, oh, Julius Rosenwald was was a great man, and he was Jewish, and so you all ought to love us. Uh, uh, you know, you, 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 we need to be, we need to take that history and understand that history, but bring it forward into today. Uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping that on the trip, you know, we're able to see some of these iconic places and uh, and feel some of the feelings, but 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 then to translate that into today's actions, I think is what's really critical. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would add, and forgive me for reverting into a kind of more rabbinic voice in the last minute that we have, but I, you know, there's a quote that I think about a lot um, in one of his um, short essays, Rabbi Abraham Isaac Cook, who was the, you know, the first chief rabbi of what was then Palestine, talks about how the, his idea that the great dreams, grand pictures, grand dreams are the foundation of the world. Um, I think what he's trying to get at is that if we're not animated by some greater vision of what's possible, sort of the meaning and the purpose of our lives ends up dissipating. And this is a moment in which I think dreams for America, um, many of us feel deeply wounded, depressed, even a little cynical right now, and the greatest way to resist that cynicism, I think, is to act in effective ways where acting effectively is in fact possible, which is why I think the work you're doing is so important and so sacred. Um, you know, the late Vincent Harding, who was a, um, a minister and a, a close confidant of Martin Luther King's, 
um, used to say this question, which I think is really haunting. He would often say, is America still possible? Um, and that's a question I think that is really an animating question that we ought to take with us every day of our lives as citizens of this country. Um, and especially at this moment, is America still possible? And by extension, what are we willing to do to make it possible? Thank you both so much. Um, thank and you thank for you for those, those words. Yep. They were really inspiring. Um, thank you both for the really thank you both for the really hard work and for inspiring us as we go forward to this trip. And um, maybe we'll ask you back on the other side, <laughs> Rabbi, um, after we've had our experience. Right. And I'm sure it will be a journey for many of us. Um, and we will be reflecting on it and uh, and then putting a path forward for our work and rebuilding our relationships with the African-American community. Thank you so much. And for those who are tuning in, who haven't got given their forms and the requested information, please get that, get that into us as soon as possible. Okay, thank you.